Welcome back. Before we move on, let's recap what's already been covered. You learn how to define project management, what a project is, what it isn't, and how to explain its value to businesses. You also discussed when and why it's necessary to have a project manager, the role and day-to-day -day responsibilities of a project manager, and the core skills needed to be a successful project manager. Now's a good time to stop and recognize how much you've learned. By now, you're familiar with the job of project management, and you've started learning what it takes to be an effective project manager. Now you'll go a little further and learn some of the ins and outs of the job. And before you know it, you'll be ready to guide any project successfully. Are you ready? Well, coming up, I'll introduce you to the two most popular approaches to project management, Waterfall and Agile. We'll also cover the project management life cycle and phases, and you'll learn about the different styles, scenarios, and factors that can impact a project and its tasks at any given phase. When we're done, you'll be able to explain and follow the life cycle of a project, define and outline a project's phases and each phase's tasks, compare different project management methodologies to determine which methodology is most effective for a project, and finally, organize how a project is run according to different program management methodologies. Ready? Let's get started. No two projects are exactly the same, which means there are many different ways to manage them. Each project comes with its own needs and factors that impact how you'll take action and achieve your goals. There are many ways to manage projects, and not always one right way to do so. Picture this. You're project managing a political campaign for a local candidate. To make it happen, you need to think about things like your available resources, the people you'll be working with, the election date, and the location. You need to be aware of lots of details to successfully complete your project. Because so many different things can impact a project, it's important to understand its basic structure. We call this structure the project life cycle. The life cycle is a great way to guide your project in the right direction so that you and your project stay on track and end up in the right place. Most project life cycles have four major phases, each with their own set of tasks and concerns. Check it out. The main phases of a project are initiate the project, make a plan, execute and complete tasks, and finally close the project. Let's talk about the first phase, initiate the project. This is the launch pad for the entire process of your project. In this phase, you'll define project goals and deliverables. Identify the budget and resources you'll need, the people involved in your project, and any other details that can impact the successful completion of your project. You'll document all this information in one place to showcase the project's value and hopefully get approval to move forward with it. Once the project is approved, it's time to get rolling. Next, you'll make a plan for how you'll meet the goals of your project. There are all kinds of ways to plan your project, and we'll get into some different methods and techniques later on. But right now, the important thing to know is that for every single project, Creating a plan of how you're going to meet your goals is absolutely 100% essential. Think about it. You can't hire a contractor to build a house without planning what it'll look like or how much you have to spend. These same considerations apply to any project that you manage. To be effective, your plan needs to include a lot of things. For example, a budget, a breakdown of all the tasks that you need to be completed, ways to communicate team roles and responsibilities, a schedule, resources, and what to do in case your project encounters problems or needs to change. Now that's just to name a few. Once you have your plan in place, it's time to execute and complete those tasks. It's important to point out that your project team has the job of completing the project tasks. Now as a project manager, your role is a little different. While you might be in charge of completing certain tasks in the project, your primary tasks as the project manager are to monitor progress and keep your team motivated. You'll also remove any obstacles that might come up so that the tasks are executed well and on time. Finally, 
when all the tasks have been completed, all the resources have been accounted for, and the project has crossed the finish line, it's time to close the project. Why is it important to close? Well, one big reason is so your team has a moment to celebrate all of their hard work. But closing the project is also a chance to evaluate how the project went. You can make note of what worked and what didn't, so you can plan better for next time. Even if the project was a massive success, it's helpful to take time to reflect. Closing the project is also a great way to connect with anyone outside your team who may have had interest in the project's goal. You can let everyone know what was completed and what you accomplished. Some projects, like the campaign example, will have a firm end date. Once the project is finished, that's it. There's no more work to do. Other projects have different finish lines. For example, a project where you're implementing a new ordering system at a restaurant is complete after the system is set up and the employees know how it works. At that point, your goals are completed. Now it's time to hand over the project to another group whose job it is to provide support and make sure the system stays running on a day-to-day -day basis. Another example of this is, I once project managed the creation of a dashboard that would be used by various stakeholders in my organization. This dashboard would show pertinent information to each stakeholder depending on the team that they were a part of in our broader organization. I project managed the beginning from writing out the vision for the project to the end where we delivered the dashboard. Now, once I passed off the final product, I transitioned the continued update of each team's data and the corresponding dashboard page to the respective teams. Think of it like turning over the keys of a newly built house to its new owner. The project of building the house is complete, and now it's up to the owner to take care of the house's maintenance and the upkeep. So there you have it. The project lifecycle, the exact name for each phase, might change depending on the type of project or organization you work for, but the general idea stays the same. And following the project processes you will learn in this course will set you up for project management success. Next, we'll take a closer look into what happens during each phase of the traditional project lifecycle. Now that we've discussed the project lifecycle, we're going to explore some of the different tasks that match up with each lifecycle phase. But first, let's review the phases. The project lifecycle phases are initiate the project, make a plan, execute and complete tasks, and close out the project. OK, great. Let's get back to the tasks that need to be accomplished during each phase. For this video, we're going to focus on the first two project lifecycle phases, initiating the project and making a plan. It's important to call out that the name or tasks for each phase might change or may be a little different depending on the type of project or the organization where you work. At Google, we use a mix of different project management methods, which you'll learn more about later in the course. But regardless of the method, all projects share a lot of the same tasks needed to get the job done. So let's get into it. The first step of the project lifecycle is to initiate the project. During initiation, you'll organize all of the information you have available to you about your project. This way, when you're ready to continue on, you'll be prepared for the next phase when you can create your plan. Defining project goals makes the details of your project clear so that you and your team can successfully complete the project. For example, if the project goal is to manage a political campaign, then some deliverables, which are specific tasks or outcomes, might be to raise $5,000 or get 500 signatures in support of your candidate's cause. With this in mind, you'll need to do some research to come up with ideas that will help you meet your goals. You'll also need to find out what resources are available. Resources can include people, equipment, software programs, vendors, physical space or locations, and more. Anything you need to actually complete the project is considered a resource. Now, as a project manager, you'll record all of these details in your project proposal and then get them approved by a decision maker or group of decision makers at your company so that you can move ahead with your project plans. 
Now, in some cases, you may be the decision maker, so be sure to consider the same set of factors when initiating your project before moving to the next stage. No worries, you will learn all the details about how to create a project proposal. We will be getting into more detail of what this is and how to create one later in the course. Voila, once your project is approved, you'll move into the second step of the project life cycle, which is to make a plan. In this phase, you'll create a budget and set the project schedule. You'll establish the project team and determine each person's roles and responsibilities. Let's pause for a second. You may be thinking, ugh, why can't we just get started? But that's the thing with project management. Deliberate planning is critical to a project's success. A crucial part of project management is planning for risk and change. An experienced project manager knows that plans always change. This ability to adapt is all about thinking and planning ahead. Scheduling delays, budget changes, technology and software requirements, legal issues, quality control, and access to resources are just some of the more common types of risks and changes that a project manager needs to consider. So it's important to keep in mind that planning is key to reducing those risks. But don't worry, if the idea of risks seems a little overwhelming right now, in later courses, we'll teach you all about understanding risks. Just know that it's really important not to skip this step and to always make a plan. Again, the success of your project depends on it. Once you have a plan, you'll communicate all of this information to your team. That way, each member will know which tasks they'll own and what to do if they have questions or if they run into problems. You'll also communicate your plan with others who have an interest in the project's success so that they are aware of your plans and your progress as the project continues to move forward. Nice job. We've made it halfway through the steps of a project life cycle. Up next, we'll check out the remaining two phases, executing and completing tasks and closing the project. Catch you in a bit. Welcome back. We just learned about the core tasks that need to be completed and the first two phases of the project life cycle, initiating the project and making plans. Now, it's time to put your plans into action. Remember, it's not your job to actually do all the tasks. Your primary job as the project manager is to manage the progress of the project as a whole. This means you'll oversee your team's efforts and make sure everyone understands what's expected of them, what tasks need to be done, and how and when to complete those tasks. It's also your job to help remove any obstacles and to alert the right people if it looks like there might be a delay to the project. This means you'll need to communicate with your team and anyone else involved in your project through meetings, written communications like memos, emails or internal chat tools, and other working documents like task reports. Quick pro tip, if in doubt, err on the side of over communication. As your project progresses, you'll make adjustments to the schedule, budget, and allocation of resources, clearly communicating updates all along the way. When all the tasks are complete and you've met the project goal, it's time to close the project. This phase is usually overlooked because it's easy to assume that once the project goal has been delivered, everyone can move on, but hold up. There's still a lot that needs to be done. First, check to make sure all tasks have been completed including any work that was added along the way. Be sure any outstanding invoices have been paid, resources are returned and accounted for, and project documentation has been submitted. Next, and this is very important, get confirmation that the final outcome of your project is acceptable to the people you're delivering it to. It is crucial to your project success that the person who asked you to manage the project is satisfied with the end result. Once your project has been accepted as meeting its goals, take some time to reflect on what went well and maybe what didn't go so well. This reflection is usually called a retrospective, and it's a chance to note best practices and learn how to manage a project more effectively next time. Even if everything went great, the notes from your retrospective are also valuable to the people or organization receiving the end result of the project. 
That's because they can use that information to inform decisions about their business the next time they consider a project. Now it's time to collect all the project documentation that you've created or collected along the way, including all of your plans and reflections and share the final results of your project with your stakeholders. Remember, stakeholders are people who are interested in and affected by the project's completion and success. Depending on the type of project, stakeholders could include a department or organization's management team, clients or customers of your product or service, users of your new tool or process, or even the community at large if you're planning a community town hall meeting. Pro tip, stakeholders play a huge role in the development and success of your project. You'll learn a lot more about these key players later on, but for now, just know that they are like the VIPs of your project. Next, take some time to celebrate the effort your team invested in the project. Celebrations help people feel good about the work they've done and think of the work as uplifting and rewarding because it truly is. Some ideas for small celebrations are a company or a team-wide email, thanking the team and acknowledging individual efforts. Now for big projects, you may even consider a company party to celebrate the team and the project's success. To wrap up, you and your team can formally move on from the project so that you can pursue new projects in the future. Well, as you can see, being a project manager is a lot of work, but it's very rewarding and it's all, well, manageable when you follow through with the project lifecycle. You can see how the organization, communication, and improvements you add to various areas of a project can make the entire team more effective and efficient. And you can have an impact on many areas of a project in a way that's greater than if you focused on any one task on the project. Similar to a coach with a sports team, even though you aren't actually playing a direct role in the game, your guidance, your communication, and your team building can make the difference in a happy, high-performing, and successful team. In later courses, we'll discuss each of these project phases, and you'll learn methods, techniques, and tools to help you. For now, we just want you to become familiar with the general project management process, and we'll share some of the terms and concepts used in the field that you'll need to know as you develop your project management skills. Up next, we'll introduce you to two of the more popular project methodologies, Waterfall and Agile. See you soon. Welcome back. As we've already discussed, not all projects are alike. Different types of projects will benefit from applying different project management approaches or methodologies. A project management methodology is a set of guiding principles and processes for owning a project through its life cycle. Project management methodologies help guide project managers throughout a project with steps to take, tasks to complete, and principles for managing the project overall. We will talk through two different types, linear and iterative. Linear means the previous phase or task has to be completed before the next can start. A linear approach would work well for a project like building a house. You'd need the blueprint created before you can begin laying the foundation. You've got to know exactly what the house will look like, its dimensions, and what type and how many resources you'll need. Then you've got to finish the foundation before you put up the walls, and the walls before you put up the roof, and so on, before you have the finished project, which is a bungalow-style home. There's also a clear goal. You know exactly what the house will look like. It's unlikely that in the middle of building the house, your client is going to decide they'd rather have a multi-level Victorian instead of a single-level bungalow. What's more, even if they wanted the change, it's too late. You already laid the foundation and built the walls for the bungalow. Done and done. A bungalow is what they wanted and a bungalow is what they'll get. Using this type of linear project management approach, completing each step in order and sticking to the agreed upon specific results and being able to deliver just what the client ordered. For a project like producing a new show for a television company, on the other hand, it might be more effective to use a methodology that uses an iterative, more flexible approach, where some of the phases and tasks will overlap or happen at the same time that other tasks are being worked on. Your team comes up with an idea for a show and films a pilot. 
You run several tests of the pilot in different locations and time slots. As your team gathers feedback about the pilot, adjustments to the show are made. At the same time, you're able to make decisions and start working on other parts of the project, like hiring permanent actors, starting film production, and working on advertising, even while the final version of the show is being worked on. And even though the overall goal is clear, produce a new show, the type of show could end up being different from the original idea. Your team may have started out creating a one-hour show, but during testing, they realized a half-hour show would actually be more popular. Or maybe a supporting character got a lot of positive feedback, so you want to make them one of the main characters. What's more important is that you produce a show that audiences are going to watch. Because of the iterative approach, plans remain flexible and you're able to make adjustments as you go along. Each of these projects benefits from a different approach to how tasks will be carried out in order to best meet the project's goals. Linear projects don't require many changes during development and have a clear sequential process. If you stick to the plan, it's likely you'll finish your tasks within the time schedule and all other criteria. Iterative projects allow for more flexibility and anticipate changes. You're able to test out parts of the project to make sure they work before the final result is delivered. And you can deliver parts of the project as they are completed, rather than waiting for the entire project to be done. Over the years, the field of project management has developed many different methods that project managers can choose from that will help them manage most effectively. Google takes a hybrid approach to project management. We mix and match from different methods depending on the type of project. Our project managers are encouraged to adapt their own style to what makes the most sense to their project and their team. So are you starting to see how different approaches might benefit the projects you'll be working on now? Pretty soon, you'll become a pro at picking an approach or combining approaches to fit with your project. Up next, we'll learn about the most well-known and most used project management methods that you can add to your project management toolbox. Two of the most popular project management methodologies are Waterfall and Agile. Each of these methods has a rich and complex history. In fact, you could take an entire certificate on just one of these methods alone. You'll have a chance to learn more about Waterfall and Agile methods in the upcoming courses of this certificate. So be sure to check those out after completing this one to learn more. For now, I'll just give you a brief introduction and provide you with some examples that illustrate how different types of projects can be more successful or easier to manage when you consider which method to use. First, let's take a look at the waterfall approach. Waterfall, as a methodology, was created in the 70s and refers to the sequential ordering of phases. You complete one at a time, down the line, like a waterfall starting at the top of a mountain and traveling to the bottom. Remember the definition and example of linear from that last video? Well, waterfall has a linear approach. At first, waterfall was used in the physical engineering disciplines, like manufacturing and construction. Then software emerged as an important field of engineering, and waterfall was applied to those kinds of projects as well. It's still used a lot in engineering fields, including product feature design and application, also known as app design. Over time, other industries like event planning and retail have adapted waterfall phases to fit their projects. There are now many styles of waterfall, and each style has its own specific set of steps. What they all have in common, though, is that they follow an ordered set of steps that are directly linked to clearly defined expectations, resources, and goals that are not likely to change. Let's take a closer look. The phases of a waterfall project lifecycle follow the same standard project lifecycle flow that you learned about earlier. Initiating, planning, executing, which includes managing and completing tasks, and closing. So, when would you want to use a waterfall approach to project management? Well, when the phases of the project are clearly defined, or when there are tasks to complete before another can begin, or when changes to the project are very expensive to implement once it's started. For example, if you were catering an event for a client on a very tight budget, you might want to use waterfall methodology. This way, you could confirm the number of guests first, 
then very clearly define the menu, get approval and agreement on the menu items and costs, order the unreturnable ingredients, and successfully feed the guests. Because the budget is limited, you can't afford to make changes or waste food. The traditional method won't allow for the client to make changes to the menu once the order has been placed. You can also reserve tables, chairs, and dishes because you know exactly how much and what kind of food is being prepared. A well thought out traditional approach to managing a project can help you reach your desired outcome with as little pain as possible during the project implementation. By spending extra effort thinking through the entire project up front, you'll set yourself up for success. Now, in an ideal world, following this approach will help you identify the right people and tasks, plan accordingly to avoid any hiccups along the way, create room for documenting your plans and progress, and enable you to hit that goal. However, plans don't always go, well, according to plan. In fact, they rarely do. The waterfall method has some risk management practices to help avoid and deal with project changes. Luckily, there are other methodologies that are entirely built for change and flexibility. One of these is Agile, another popular project management approach. The term Agile means being able to move quickly and easily. It also refers to flexibility, which means being willing and able to change and adapt. Projects that use an Agile approach often have many tasks being worked on at the same time, or in various stages of completion, which makes it an iterative approach. The concepts that shaped Agile methodology began to emerge in the 90s as a response to the growing demand for faster delivery of products, mainly software applications at that time. But it wasn't officially named Agile until 2001. The phases of an Agile project also follow the project life cycle stages we described earlier, generally speaking. However, rather than having to always go in order or wait for one phase to end before starting the next, agile project phases overlap and tasks are completed in iterations, which in Scrum are called sprints. Scrum is a form of agile that you'll learn more about in the course focused entirely on agile. And by sprint, we do not mean running a race as fast as possible. In this case, sprints are short chunks of time, usually one to four weeks, where a team works together to focus on completing specific tasks. What's important to understand is that Agile is more of a mindset than just a series of steps or phases. It's concerned with building an effective collaborative team that seeks regular feedback from the client so that they can deliver the best value as quickly as possible and adjust as changes emerge. Projects that are best suited for an agile approach are those where the client has an idea of what they want, but doesn't have a concrete picture in mind, or they have a set of qualities they'd like to see in the end result, but aren't as concerned with exactly what it looks like. Another indicator that a project may benefit from agile is the level of high uncertainty and risk involved with the project. We'll talk more about those things later. An example of a project that would work well with an agile approach might be building a website. Your team would build the different parts of the website in sprints and deliver each part to the client as they are built. This way, the website can be launched with some parts, say the main homepage, that are complete and ready for public view, while other parts, maybe the company blog or the ability to book online appointments, continue to get built out over time. This allows the team to get feedback early on about what works and what doesn't, make adjustments along the way, and reduce wasted efforts. In this same website example, the waterfall method will plan for and require the whole website to be complete before it can launch. Having a basic understanding of waterfall and agile will help you figure out an effective way to organize and plan out your project. And knowing about these two methodologies will come in handy during future job interviews because you'll be able to demonstrate a solid understanding of the project management landscape. Waterfall and Agile are two of the more common and well-known project management methodologies, but they are by no means the only or the best ones. In the next videos, you'll learn about Lean Six Sigma, another way to approach projects. Here at Google, believe it or not, we select from many of these methodologies for project management. Hey again.
Now you've got waterfall and agile methodologies in your project manager toolbox. Lean Six Sigma is one more you can add. It's a combination of two parent methodologies, Lean and Six Sigma. The uses for Lean Six Sigma are common in projects that have goals to save money, improve quality, and move through processes quickly. It also focuses on team collaboration, which promotes a positive work environment. The idea is that when your team feels valued, motivation and productivity increases, and the whole process functions more smoothly. There are five phases in the Lean Six Sigma approach. They are define, measure, analyze, improve, and control, commonly known as DMAIC. DMAIC is a strategy for process improvement, meaning you're trying to figure out where the problems are in the current process and fix them so that everything runs more smoothly. The goal of each step is to ensure the best possible results for your project. Just like with Waterfall and Agile, there are more specific details for using DMAIC and the Lean Six Sigma approach. But what's great about the DMAIC process is that it can be used to solve any business problem. Let's break it down. The first phase is to define the project goal and what it will take to meet it. This first phase is very similar to the initiation phase of traditional project management. Let's take a real scenario to illustrate. Imagine that you are brought on as a project manager for a large travel company to help streamline and minimize customer service wait times that have been surging due to a recent sales promotion. Before you begin working on tackling the issue, you're going to need to define the project goal and talk to stakeholders about expectations for the project. In this case, the goal is to take average wait times down to less than 10 minutes on average compared to 30 minutes. Next, it's time to measure how the current process is performing. In order to improve processes, DMAIC focuses on data. Here you want to map out the current process and locate exactly where the problems are and what kind of effect the problems have on the process. Using our example, you're trying to figure out why it's taking so long for the travel company to address a customer service issue. To do this, you look at company data, like average wait times, number of customers per day, and seasonal variations. Then you'll set a plan for how you'll get that data and how often to measure it. This could look something like having the company generate reports on a weekly, monthly, quarterly basis. In other situations, you might have employees or customers fill out surveys or look at inventory shipping and tracking records, things like that. Once you have the data and measurements, you can move on to the next phase, which is analyze. Here, you'll begin to identify gaps and issues. In our example, after mapping out the process and data points, you may see that staffing is inadequate on days where customers are the highest. Data analysis is important for project managers regardless of which method you choose, and we will learn more about that in an upcoming course. From your data, you'll have a strong understanding of causes and solutions to get to the next stage. Improve. Oftentimes, project managers may want to leap straight to this phase, but really, projects and process improvements should only be made after a careful analysis. This is the point where you present your findings and get ready to start making improvements. In our example, this could be modifying staffing to address customer needs. The last step of this cycle is control. You've gotten the process and project to a good place, and now it's time to implement it and keep it there. Controlling is all about learning from the work you did up front to put new processes and documentation in place and continue to monitor so the company doesn't revert back to the old, inefficient way of doing things. To sum it all up, you can remember DMAIC like this. Defining tells you what to measure. Measuring tells you what to analyze. Analyzing tells you what to improve. And improving tells you what to control. Lean Six Sigma and the DMAIC approach are ideal when the project goal includes improving a current process to fix complex or high-risk problems, like improving sales, conversions, or eliminating a bottleneck, which is when things get backed up during a process. Following the DMAIC process prevents the likelihood of skipping important steps and increases the chances of a successful project, and as a way for your team to discover best practices 
that your client can use going forward. It uses data and focuses on the customer or end user to solve problems in a way that builds on previous learning so that you can discover effective permanent solutions for difficult problems. There are many ways out there that break the flow of project management into digestible phases and approaches, all with the same end goal of accomplishing the desired outcome as smoothly as possible and delivering the best value. Like I said earlier, at Google, we follow a lot of different approaches. For instance, an engineering team releasing a customer-focused product may primarily use Agile when creating the product, but decide to plug in some of the aspects of waterfall project management for planning and documentation. A customer service team might focus on using Lean Six Sigma to improve an experience for our users, like offering new features based on a recent analysis. But the team might develop parts of the code and roll out the features using agile iterations and sprints to allow for change. Or one of our internal education and training teams may focus solely on waterfall project management to achieve a targeted goal of having all employees complete an annual compliance training. Here, Waterfall makes sense since the requirements of the training program are fixed and so is the deadline and goal. The biggest takeaway is to know the various methods and tools to be able to confidently apply what works best for you, your team, and the end goal. There is no real prescription for how to execute a project perfectly because there are always pieces you can't 100% control. But the good news is, you can get pretty close with the skill sets you develop through learning about these different frameworks. Congrats on completing this module on the project lifecycle and project management methodologies. So what did you think? Hopefully, this introduction to a few of the core project management methodologies and hearing from a Googler about the way we approach project management here at Google has you interested and excited to keep on learning. One of the great things about project management is that it can be really creative and present you with challenging problems to solve that have a rewarding impact. You get to work with teams full of interesting, skilled, and dedicated people who help with the problem solving and idea generating process. Every project is an opportunity to learn and try something new. Waterfall, Agile, and Lean Six Sigma are solid foundations from which to build your understanding of project management. Each methodology has its own set of rules, values, and processes. There is no such thing as a right or a wrong methodology. There is no one-size-fits-all approach to take. And there's almost no limit to the number of ways you can blend different approaches to fit the needs of your project. Your goal in choosing a methodology is to maximize the use of resources and time. The method, or combination of methods, will help you reach your goal in the most efficient and effective way. This might feel like choice overload right here, but hang in there. With time and practice, you'll become more comfortable with the benefits and limits of different methodologies, and you'll be able to approach your project assignments with confidence. Next, you'll build on these foundations by learning how an organization's structure and culture can impact the way you manage your project. See you soon.